the end of imperialism looked a little different in Africa. Throughout the 1920s, there was a movement of pan-Africanism, meaning the unity of all Africans and people of African descent all over the world. And during this time, because of the basically all the Africans working together, many started to fight for their freedom. The Gold Coast was a British colony. Kwame uh, Nehruma, inspired by Pan-Africanism and Gandhi, organized boycotts and strikes to battle the British. Eventually, he's going to win. In 1957, Ghana becomes independent with him becoming its prime minister. He also creates the Organization of African Unity, or the OAU, to promote Pan-Africanism and end colonialism in Africa. In Kenya, Jomo, Jomo Kenyatta used violence to gain Kenyan freedom from uh, Britain and was jailed. He later was released and would become the Prime Minister of Kenya, and you can see that they named it after him, Kenyatta Kenya, that's an easy way to remember the two. And the big thing with these leaders, guys, is you need to know they were nationalistic leaders from Africa. The regents really doesn't get too much into them. You just have to know that they were pro-African, wanted to kick the European powers out of Africa and have Africa become independent of the Europeans. Algeria um, had a strong Muslim nationalistic movement going on. It was uh, controlled by the French. Finally, in 1962, they got the French out, and it became a free nation. Many of the economic links between Africa and Europe still exist today. Many of the trade relations between Europe and Africa are the same as they were hundreds of years ago. And this is the problem. Because of this, many African nations still rely on experts and a few cash crops. A cash crop is something that a farmer grows just for the money. In most cases, you cannot eat it. Think cotton, think um, marijuana, think heroin, um, excuse me, opium, which is used to make heroin and other drugs. Uh, think, you know, the silk worms, that whole kind of thing with the silk worms growing on certain plants. But there are crops that they can trade and make a lot of money off of, but you can't eat them. And so normally if a, an a economy is stuck on a cash crop, their people are suffering from lack of food. As they rely greatly on these cash crops, uh, more and more manufactured goods are imported to, from Europe. As a result, the African countries have weak economies, trade deficits, and rising debts. Basically, Africa, even though it's been free for almost you know, 50 years now, they still are dealing with the after effects of the European colonialism. It's still primarily a poor continent. There's still outbursts of violence, civil wars, and things of that nature. They're trying to get things better. They're trying very hard to modernize the country. But it's difficult because in most countries, the, the nat natural resources are controlled by European co um, companies. Ethnic tensions and nationalism throughout Africa is very high. Most of the current national boundaries in Africa were established during the colonial period. These were made without consideration of the traditional territories of tribal or ethnic groups. We saw this with the Berlin Conference of 1884. They carved Africa up like it was a Thanksgiving turkey, not caring anything for the locals and tribes who lived there. As a result, most... Uh, some of these ethnic groups were separated into different nations while others were mixed in within nations. Therefore, there was loyalty to one's tribe was much stronger than loyalty to one nation. Now, the Murdoch ethnic map here from 1959, all those different shades of tan and pink and brown and black and gray represent all of the different ethnic groups in Africa. So that's why it is so difficult today to get all of them to work together against a common enemy because they spend a lot of time fighting each other. Nigeria has more than 200 ethnic groups there. It has, been, has a history of tribalism which led to civil war, massacres, and famine. Rwanda, which you can study as one of your genocides. Uh, in 1994, there was a huge ethnic conflict between the majority Hutu tribe and the minority Tutsi tribe led to the Rwandan genocide, which you can do your genocide project on if you want to. Horrific, horrific. 
hundreds of thousands dead. In the country of Darfur, there was a conflict in um, the region of Darfur, Sudan, Darfur today. Darfur today is an independent country. Um, Arabic militias have killed more than 200,000 black villagers with the quiet approval of the Sudanese government. The whole region in this area still has a lot of fighting going on today. The country of Sudan has been split into North Sudan and South Sudan, but there still is a lot of conflict there. In 2002, 53 African uh, countries formed the African uh, Union, the AU, to solve economic, social, and political and envir environmental problems in Africa. This includes desertification, the rise of AIDS, and famine. Now, in South Africa, they had their own unique problem known as apartheid. South Africa won its independence from Britain in 1910, but even though it was an independent country, it was completely controlled by white British citizens. Um, black Africans, black South Africans had absolutely no power, could not hold decent jobs, could not hold political uh, office, and they could not go to the same schools. Very similar to segregation in America in, up into the 1950s and early 60s. To control the nation's government and economy, whites in 1948 made official a system called apartheid, which means the separation of the races. Apartheid required black Africans to live in certain zones in South Africa. It was segregation of all public facilities and transportation. You can see here they had uh, different bathrooms, as you can tell by the bathroom signs. And they actually had, you know, white restaurants, black uh, restaurants. There was actually curfews. Black citizens had to be off the streets at night. And if your job required you to work at night and where you'd be walking, you had to have a special permit by the government or else the police would arrest you. Now, in 1912, the political party known as the African National Congress, or the ANC, was organized in South Africa. Their whole goal was to try to end apartheid, and they used boycotts, nonviolent civil disobedience to oppose it. Mohatnas Gandhi actually worked with the ANC for several years, and he really helped with this whole nonviolent civil disobedience movement. In 1960, there was a shooting at Sharpsville, and the police killed 69 people and wounded 180 at a demonstration. This is when things got very bad in South Africa. The government reacted by outlawing the ANC, um, which at that point, one of the leaders was Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was an important ANC leader. He was a lawyer by trade, and in 1964, he was sentenced to life imprisonment um, for really no good reason. During his time in prison, 39 years, Mandela became a powerful system of freedom, struggle for freedom. He became almost like a martyr or a saint. He wrote letters while in prison. They did not let him out to see when his son was killed. He was uh, not allowed very limited um, visitations. He didn't ever, was not there to see his kids grow up, uh, missed one of his kids' weddings. Um, they wouldn't even let him out when his parents were killed. So... It was a very tough, tough struggle for Nelson Mandela. Another leader in South Africa during this time was Desmond Tutu. He was an Anglican bishop, a Christian bishop, and a civil rights leader. He, while Nelson Mandela was doing this through nonviolence and a lot of letter writing, Tutu kind of realized that if we get the idea of apartheid out there, where if the rest of the world knows what they're doing here to us, then other countries and businesses will stop giving money to South Africa. They will stop trading and investing in South Africa. And he was very good at this. When I was a kid, nobody really knew about apartheid until Desmond Tutu started getting on the news, really started being vocal about it. And one of the first places that a lot of young people you know, realized about apartheid was in the 1980s was through MTV because MTV had huge impact down there doing reporting, showing rock stars and, you know, very famous people saying, don't go to South Africa, don't travel there, don't spend money on South African goods this way until they stop the segregation and the apartheid. Now, W.F. de Klerk, okay, became president of South Africa in 1989. He was a white South African. He realized that the 
A park died, had to go. He realized the times were changing, so he immediately legalized the ANC, African National Congress. He repealed all the segregation and apartheid laws and released Mandela from prison in 1990. And there you can see the famous picture of him getting out of prison. His wife is standing next to him in the newspaper picture. So, but uh, de Klerk, F.W. de Klerk was, and here's a picture of him right there holding hands with Mandela, uh, in 1994, South Africa finally had an election in which all races could vote, all men and women, black, white, didn't matter, and Mandela ran for president and was unanimously elected. They, they, he became president of South Africa. So, and he remained president for several years, did a lot of good there, uh, eventually would retire, still was a very much a champion for human rights around the world, and he just died several years ago. And here is a cartoon showing the similarities between South Africa and Palestine with apartheid. We're going to get to Palestine and what their life is like because they have their own version of apartheid while under uh, rule in their country. Southeast Asia. After World War II, growing nationalistic feelings spread throughout Indochina and other parts of Southeast Asia. Okay, Vietnam, during World War II, the Vietnam was an alliance of nationalistic and communist groups that fought the occupying Japanese. Now, of course, as we just talked about last unit, this is going to lead to the uh, eventually Ho Chi Minh taking over the Vietnam, trying to kick the French out. And in 1954, the Geneva Contras decided to split Vietnam, North being communist, South being non-communist. This is going to lead to the Vietnam War under the ruling of Ho Chi Minh. North Vietnam communist, South Vietnam not. Now in Cambodia, during the Vietnam War, Cambodia served as the supply route for North Vietnam. Basically, they took their supplies right through Cambodia. Cambodia did not stop them. So in 1969, the U.S. forces bombed and invaded Cambodia to destroy that route. When we left, when the U.S. left, there was nobody left to take over, so the Khmer Rouge took over, which was a communist guerrilla party, uh, basically a young army. You can see there they look like young kids, and they were very, very controlling and also, unfortunately, were trained killers. Under the leadership of Pol Pot, who is that guy right there sitting down with a smile on his face, the Khmer Rouge became a reign of terror and removed all western influence from Cambodia. If you were wearing westernized clothing, sneakers, you spoke English, French, French, excuse me, or uh, Spanish, any other other than, you know, Cambodian language, you were killed. If you were educated, you were killed. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed during this genocide and um, most of which were educated people. So Pol Pot was able to keep control for many years. More than a million Cambodians were slaughtered, and this became known as the Killing Field. You can see there the Khmer Rouge with the head of somebody they chopped off, and you can see there the bones in a temple in Khmer Rouge, just so people never forget what happened there. Um, the Killing Field is also a very famous movie from the 1980s that goes through the story of how all of this happened. In 1975... Uh, Vietnamese forces occupied Cambodia and kind of settled down the Khmer Rouge a little bit. In the 1990s, a settlement finally ended the Civil War with the United Nations' help. There is a picture of Pol Pot. He was found in the jungle, and uh, he they attempted to put him on trial for everything he did, but he died before they could get there. Myanmar in the mid 19 uh, 1900s Myanmar or Burma gained its independence but was plagued by ethnic tension and ruled by a repressive government. In 1990, Aung San Suu Kyi won an electoral victory. Suu Kyi had a strong opposition, opposition to the military. You can see a picture of her right there. The military controls everything, so they rejected the results even though and put Suu Kyi under house arrest even though she won the presidency. She was released in 1995, jailed again in 2000, and then re-released again in 2002. She is out again and still fighting for her country. Um, 
but there's still massive amounts of unrest there. This is why we have many, many of our new refugees come from this area of the world.